you tell someone you're an alcoholic and all it is is a joke. They don't realize that it's every bit as much of a hooked in addiction problem as heroin is. You can't stop cold turkey when you're drinking this much because you will have a seizure and die. I, I had suicide plans mapped out towards the end of my alcoholism. I, you know, I'd literally just thought I can't live like this. And if I had have not been living with my parents at that point, I would have been absolutely out on the street. I would have been homeless. So this is a video that I have been meaning to make for a really, really, really long time. But equally, it has taken me that really, really long time to feel remotely comfortable sharing my experiences of alcoholism. That even though I've been very open on here about drug addiction, I feel a great deal more shame talking about alcoholism. And that's something I do want to talk about in this video. Um, I'm coming up for three years sober in March this year, which is pretty cool. Um, and I have in the past talked a little bit about my experiences with heroin addiction. And I thought it would be interesting to just juxtapose these two experiences together, heroin addiction and alcoholism, because my experience of these things has led me to think the ways that people view heroin addiction and alcoholism are so weird and backwards that if you tell someone you're a heroin addict, they like it's a serious thing they're like oh my god you're gonna die like why would you get into that that is like the worst thing in the world to get into you're too clever for that why would you do that that's mad we need to get you to rehab you're gonna die this is serious however you tell someone you're an alcoholic and all it is is a joke um i remember when i was actively an alcoholic when i was a severe alcoholic drinking literally a bottle of jack daniels a day so that was sometimes a regular sized bottle of jack daniels sometimes a liter bottle of jack daniels so that's between 30 and 40 units of alcohol a day um literally from the minute i woke up till the minute i went to bed often waking up in the night to drink more like constantly plastered and it was such a joke to other people that I literally got a birthday card that year from a relative who is actually a trained therapist. She sent me a birthday card that said one tequila, two tequila, three tequila, floor. And that was a birthday card sent from a trained therapist to a severe alcoholic. Can you imagine doing that with heroin addiction? Can you imagine sending someone a birthday card that said, ha oh, ha ha, have a good time shooting smack today, don't, don't stab the syringe in your eyeball or anything? You wouldn't do that because you don't see it as a joke. So why is alcoholism seen as a joke? And I think people see it as a joke because it's like, well, look, I drink, everyone drinks, your mum drinks, your grand drinks, everyone drinks, and everyone keeps it under control. But you, for some reason, why, why are you being an idiot? And people don't realise that alcohol addiction is actually one of the most dangerous and awful addictions you can have in my experience. So starting out with a quick recap of how my experience of heroin addiction was. Now this went on for, oh my goodness, I don't remember, but probably about three years. I think that I was two, three years that I was using heavily. I was an intravenous user, um, shooting up between about three and five times a day. Um, however, I found that my usage didn't really escalate an enormous amount. Like the amount I was using stayed pretty steady. Um, I was never one of these people who wanted to just shoot themselves unconscious and just be blacked out the whole time. I liked to do some, like I like to be high as much as possible, but I, I like to be awake enough to watch movies, to listen to music, just be dipping in and out of unconsciousness. As a result of that, I never had any ODs or nothing serious. You know, I had those times where you do a shot and it was daylight and the next thing you know it's dark outside and there's a needle lying next to you and you, you realise you were unconscious for about six hours. Um, <laughs> so I had that kind of thing happen. I had another time that I nodded out and I dropped a burning joint that I was smoking on the floor and fortunately nothing caught fire you know i had these these minor like whoops kind of things but nothing that required narcan nothing that required hospitals um nothing like that so i was i was a fairly safe user and i do realize there is an element of luck in that i was always very careful testing new batches doing a small shop first and obviously you should really get a test kit or smoke a bit first rather than just going straight to shooting it. So I wasn't the most careful, but I was quite careful. 
and I found that my usage didn't escalate. So as far as money went, um, it was affordable, um, particularly that, I mean, th this is a whole topic for its own video, but there was a big drought in the UK during the period I was using and the price of heroin skyrocketed after that. But even then, um, I will get to the prices when, when I, talk about alcohol, I want to compare the prices there, but heroin, it was affordable. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going vastly into debt. It wasn't like I was having to do anything crazy to make money to afford my habit. Um, and I was a very functional junkie. Um, I, sorry, I know the J word really offends some people. I actually find I'm more comfortable with the word junkie than I am addict. I don't like the word addict much, whereas junkie, I, I, I don't mind that word, but apologies if you do. So I was a functional addict. Um, during the time I was doing heroin, I completed a college access course. So that's basically like A-levels. Um, I did most of my university degree while actively a heroin addict. Um, I had a social life. I was healthy. Like I, I mean, I lost some weight. I did look really quite thin. I remember going out clubbing at Halloween and a girl coming up to me and being a friend, you know, who hadn't seen me in a while, coming up and being like, dude, like, what is going on? You've lost so much weight, you look really sick, what's happening? And I couldn't really say to her, like, yeah, so I do a lot of heroin these days. And uh, that's not a problem as far as I'm concerned. I want to keep on doing it, but that's why I'm so skinny. You, you can't say that because heroin has such a stigma attached to it. Um, so I told, I told no one in my friendship group while I was using. Something that does need mentioning is that I was on methadone for pretty much the whole time I was an addict, um, which obviously methadone places, they don't really like you to be actively using while on a script for obvious reasons. You know, the whole point is to help you recover and to get off. They don't really want you to just be picking up your script, throwing it in the cupboard and doing heroin <laughs> instead. Um, but I wish they would be more open to that. I really do because the reason I was able to be so functional as a heroin addict was that I was on a methadone script, which made using a choice. Um, so, you know, if I had a day where I had college lectures, well, I would just take some methadone in the morning and I would be fine to go to college all day and I wouldn't have to worry about withdrawal if my dealers weren't picking up, if there was a drought, as there was, as I say. If I wanted to go on holiday, well, that's fine. I had my methadone script. I could go abroad. I could you know, I could live a normal life and heroin use was optional. So I, I never lived that really terrible, like junky lifestyle of waking up rattling, having to immediately go out, like try and score while you're trying not to shit your pants and you're freezing cold and you're shivering and sweating and your nose is running and all of the rest of it. I never had to live that experience because I have my methadone script. Um, and fortunately I was able enough to be controlled enough to like cut out gear for a week if I needed to do a piss test to stay on my script. I was honest about what I was doing in the main as much as I could be. Um, I don't like lying to people so I would tell the people like yeah I'm using, I'm trying to cut down. Most of the time I was using I was trying to cut down but ultimately I was fine using heroin. I was completely healthy. I didn't get any abscesses. Um, I didn't have any problems with my veins really. I still have, I think I have one vein that's gone, that's it. All, all my veins are still fine, like when I get a blood test they can go straight in my arm and find a vein even after all those years of using. And that was, that was after several years of intravenous use of speed and coke and ketamine and other things too. So my veins have taken a lot of abuse and yet they're still fine. Never really got me into any Okay, there's there's one story I have to tell that might have to become a story time about risky situations that heroin got me into. Um, but in the main, in the main, apart from that situation, it never really got me into anything awful. Where I live in the UK, it's very easy to get clean needles for free from a needle exchange. So I wasn't using anything dirty. I wasn't sharing needles while I was on heroin. Um, and all in all, I actually... I know it's really, really taboo to say this, but I had a really rose-tinted experience of heroin use. Um, I only stopped using because I started getting allergic to something that was in the cuts. In 2012, they started putting something else in the heroin and whatever dealer I went to, whatever I tried, I would get really sick from the cuts. 
and in the end after trying batches and batches after waiting months and then trying again after waiting a full year and then trying again it was still making me sick and it was making me so sick for so many days afterwards that it, it wasn't worth using at all and at that point I was forced to quit. So quitting heroin was never my choice um, and obviously that is a factor because it's not like my addiction ran on until things got so awful that I had to decide to quit. It was taken from me and as a result I there was a long period of time, like years, a lot of years, where I still vastly romanticised heroin um, and missed it like hell and it's only been very recent for me that I have gotten over that at all and stopped having a needle fixation and stopped constantly thinking, eh, shall I go and get some, shall I get some? Because in recent years I found actually that the cuts had changed again and I can take it now. It still makes me sick, but it doesn't make me super sick. So it's like you can do a bit and you can feel really good for about an hour and then you feel really rotten for about two days. So if you keep using, you can feel kind of okay for about about 18 hours and then you're going to feel really rubbish for three days. So that's how use is now if I do it and <laughs> I think that's why I'm finally over it is enough experiences, enough mini relapses of okay this was lovely and then oh my god three days, three days later this is rotten, I'm never doing this again. Um, it's given me enough like Pavlovian negative associations with shooting heroin that now it's crazy. I realise often, like, my god, yesterday I didn't think about heroin at all. And that, I mean, I know that sounds mad, like, most people go, you know, whole weeks without thinking about heroin at all, but when you're an ex-addict, like, for me, it was something I thought about every single day, even after having been clean for seven years, or, you know, bar those mild relapses, even when I'd gone, like, a year without anything, I would still think about heroin every single day. Um, so that that is the only really negative thing about heroin for me, was that you don't get over it fast at all. Like, it, it really gets its hooks in you, and it's, it's mentally, it's very hard to get over it. Um, and obviously withdrawal sucks if you if you ever have to go into withdrawal at all. Like I, I have never done a full cold turkey ever. I'm I can't handle that shit. I can't at all. <laughs> like call me a pussy or you like, I can't deal with it. Like people who say, oh, it's just like having the flu. It's not. If you have anxiety, particularly like I do, the the first thing that kicks in with withdrawal for me is killer anxiety and I can't handle it. Like after a few hours, I'm just crawling the walls. I will do anything to make it stop. And that was the only time I landed myself in hospital regarding heroin was when I, they just put me on methadone. It wasn't enough. I was still in withdrawal. I had killer anxiety and I ended up using something over the counter to try and make the withdrawal go away and the anxiety go away. And I ended up screwing up my liver um, quite badly and I was in hospital for a week uh, on drips and all of that just to flush out my liver and it was horrible but the irony was it only happened because I didn't have heroin it only happened because it's illegal it was the fact that it was it's illegal and that I had to use something that was a stupid idea but that was the only thing I could legally get um, and that was what got me into trouble which is one of the reasons that it does make me so angry the fact that they don't do prescription heroin for addicts. Like, sorry, I'm just, I'm gonna get on this soapbox for a little minute, but if you're interested, do have a Google. There have been multiple experiments done on prescribing clean prescription, like dose measured heroin to existing addicts. And all of these experiments have found that it works fantastically. These people, they turn their lives around, they get out of things like prostitution, dealing, stealing, they get out of these things, they get normal jobs, they're not having to run around being sick all the time, trying to score all the time. It's it's just a medication that they take in the morning and they take in the evening and they function, they go about their day and after a few months you look at them and you would not see a junkie, you would just see a normal upstanding member of society. And then the American War on Drugs came along and shut down these programs and a year later a great deal of the participants were dead. You know, I mean, can you imagine being one of those people just because someone has arbitrarily said, 
no this this drug like alcohol nicotine caffeine they can be legal you can have those but this drug is bad even on prescription even when a doctor has decided you should have this and they can see it's vastly improved your life no we're going to take it away from you and you're going to be dead because we don't care about you we think you're a dirty little junkie and you don't deserve your prescription can you imagine um so oh, there's my soapbox um i really do feel that prescription heroin would have been a good thing for me if it had have been available would i still be on it to this day if it was legal prescription wise probably but equally i'm still on methadone to this day and honestly i think i will be on methadone for the rest of my life and honestly methadone is so much longer lasting that it makes you so much groggier i would rather be to this day even now i would rather be on a prescription heroin script than on a methadone script and I think it would be good for my life if I could be. So that's that's my rose-tinted view on heroin. Obviously other people have horrible experiences, it varies for everyone, but that was my experience of heroin, now to be juxtaposed against my experience of alcoholism. So alcohol addiction, um, it's a weird one because all my life I never even enjoyed being drunk. It was one that really snuck up on me and how it started was that I'd started drinking a little bit in the evening and I quite rapidly found wow I really enjoy writing when I'm a bit buzzed um, like many people do the whole the whole quote about write drunk edit sober lots of people find that you have a few drinks and the words just flow and you can bring up these memories so easily so I really enjoyed it and a lot of this had to do with hanging out with a particular friend who does have alcohol problems to an extent not to the extent I ended up with but a very heavy drinker I was hanging out with him quite often and when I was with him you know every time he got a drink he would buy me a drink so I was kind of keeping up with this guy who had a way bigger tolerance than me around him I felt safe I knew like he will get me back to the train no matter what happens it'll be fine so I ended up pushing my limits of how comfortable I was being drunk with this guy and so when I got home, I would be this wasted and I'd carry on writing and I'd think, wow, this is great, this is really fun. And then obviously, yeah, I would wake up with a killer hangover, but when, you know, YouTube is what you do and writing is what you do and you don't have a nine to five job, you can always do hair of the dog. You know, hair of the dog, I'll just have a bit more, it'll be fine. And hair of the dog is something that so many people don't really see as this terrible thing to do every now and then. Like on the weekend, you have a heavy Saturday on the Sunday, well, you might wake up and have a whiskey for breakfast just to feel a bit better. And that is so socially sanctioned and it shouldn't be. Seriously, hair of the dog, don't get into that because you have one and it can flow on and by the evening you can end up really quite wasted again and then you're hung over the next day so what do you do you do hair of the dog and this is how it started for me that it just it flowed on because there was never a day where it was like okay this is monday you can't drink today you have to go to work i could everything that i do for work i could do at home and i could do drunk so i did and um it escalated very quickly and this is where I want to talk about money. Um, <laughs> alcohol addiction, what I was paying, what I would usually have would be, as I say, a bottle of Jack Daniels a day or a bottle of cheap gin a day. So the Jack Daniels, a big bottle costs about £20. A bigger bottle costs £30. So I would be spending £20 or £30 a day on one of these bottles of Jack. I'll calculate that by the whole week and you have got more money than I have. <laughs> like not even buying food, not even buying anything else. Alcohol, it took up every penny I had and more. I was constantly having to borrow money off people. I was constantly in my overdraft purely on alcohol. Whereas heroin addiction, wait for it, cost me 40 pounds a week. To be, to be using three to five times a day, it would cost me 40 pounds a week and even when the prices went up after the drought it went up to 80 pounds a week um which was you know harder to afford but it was still considerably less than i was spending on alcohol um and the other thing i found about alcohol was that my use did escalate and your tolerance goes up so fast like i i mean some people say their tolerance goes up very fast with heroin i didn't find that i found my tolerance really stayed much the same um but with alcohol, oh my god, my tolerance went up so fast. Like, pretty quickly I was finding that 
people thought I was drunk, I was behaving drunk, like I was falling over on my ass all the time, I was getting bruises all over me, trigger warning, you might want to look away for a few seconds, here are some of the bruises that I ended up with just from falling over on my ass, and uh, okay, bruise picture's gone, trigger warning over, um, so I was falling over all the time, um, I was slurring, I was doing crazy things, I was just generally being nutty, but I didn't feel drunk at all, like my, my ability to feel drunk had gone, so there was no pleasure in it, but I still couldn't stop. And obviously then you've got the really awful factor of the fact that you can't stop cold turkey. When you're drinking this much, you can't just go, you know what, I'm going to drink what I've got and that's it, I'm not going to drink anymore because you will have a seizure and die. Um, you have to taper yourself down slowly. Um, so the other things that happened to me health-wise, I gained 50 pounds. Um, I'm going to give you a really horrible side-by-side -side here. This is the most horrible photo that I took out of pure self-hatred at nearly my fattest from alcohol abuse. I had to take out my belly button ring because my stomach was sticking out so far it was banging on everything. Um, that jacket, I put it on because on YouTube you can only see down to here, you can't see the fact that my belly was just hanging out of the damn thing. Everyone thought I was pregnant. Um, so to give you the side by side, here is me in that jacket. Now um, it's the same jacket, believe it or not. <laughs> So that's that sober. I, I still have to put safety pins in it just to stabilize the zips. I'm still not quite down to the weight I would like to be down to. I'm still shedding alcohol weight three years later. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a lot better, a lot better than it was. So I gained 50 pounds. And speaking of someone who used to have an eating disorder, I could not stand this weight gain. I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow myself to believe that it came from drinking. Like I, I wouldn't, I because I couldn't stop. Like, I didn't want to know I'm doing this to myself. I kept thinking, it's medication. Medication is just making me fat. And to be fair, medication had already made me gain about seven pounds even before I started drinking. Um, and it certainly has slowed down my metabolism to a degree. But 50 pounds, like, come on, that, that, was, that was drinking. And it would have gotten a lot higher if I hadn't stopped. I was still gaining and gaining and gaining before I stopped drinking. And I couldn't stand what I look like. I couldn't stand myself. Like my self-image has never been worse in my entire life. I hated myself. I was self-harming a lot. I trashed my entire room in like a drunken fit of fury when I realized I finally got on the scales and saw how much weight I'd gained. Um, I trashed my room. I scribbled insults all over the wall. The radiators broke once and a plumber had to come into my room and the room looked like a hoarder tip anyway because like I didn't have the energy to do anything but the insults all over the walls like I looked like a crazy person. Um, other things health wise like you basically give yourself chronic fatigue syndrome when you're drinking that much. Um, I didn't have the energy to do anything even just waddling up the road to get my daily booze I felt like I was gonna puke or pass out or just like Ah, uh, you know, the sunlight was just flashing in my eyes. I felt like I was dying just walking up the road to get my booze. That was all I would do. And then I would sit down and I would drink and I just, I couldn't be bothered doing anything because I was exhausted. Every day you wake up and you just feel so rotten the minute you open your eyes and you can barely haul yourself out of bed. I ended up with some damage to my liver. They did a liver scan on me and I had fatty liver damage or something, fatty changes to my liver after, and this was just after one year of drinking actually. There was a time that I gave myself concussion, I don't know how, I just know I woke up on the floor and I don't remember what was going on and everything was weird. Everything felt like a computer game for about two weeks afterwards. I think what happened, because I woke up just down there, I think what happened is that I fell off my bed, which is six foot up on the ceiling, I think I fell off my bed or halfway up the ladder or something and I concussed myself and it was awful. Uh, when I went to the hospital they thought I was pregnant because I was so fat. Here's a picture that I took this thinking am I just gonna like troll people on Instagram that I'm pregnant? Uh, it was again purely out of self-hatred thinking <laughs> what can I do with this horrible look but uh, no I'm not pregnant at all but the ambulance people saw that they thought are you pregnant and alcohol in high doses stops your period so I didn't know whether I was or wasn't pregnant. I listened to my stomach and they heard noises that they thought were a heartbeat 
or the sounds of a fetus. I guess I just have a really gurgly stomach or something, but they, they'd literally, they'd looked at me, my periods were gone, they'd listened to my stomach and they'd said, I hear something. So for half an hour concussed in a cubicle, I was basically told you're having a baby. And I was thinking, I don't, I've never wanted kids, but it's happening, it's too late. It's gonna have fetal alcohol syndrome severely, but it's happening and I'm gonna have one. And that messed with my head so bad. Even, you know, even after they came in and said, we've done the P test, you're not pregnant, it's fine. Um, that messed with my head so badly. Like I started thinking, do I want a kid though? When you've been faced down with the reality that tough luck, mate, you're having one, you're too late to even have an abortion at this point, you're having one. You know, I, and I was, as I say, I was concussed for two weeks after that and I got really fixated on the idea of kids and what I would call them and what I would have called this kid. I felt, I literally felt like I had been pregnant and it had been taken away from me. I was just so concussed and so messed up in that time. Um, the other thing, I got fixated on a past trauma that I, honestly I was totally over, but alcohol, it brings up past traumas. People who say they drink to forget, you yeah you forget the next day but while you're in the moment and you're drunk you get hung up on past traumas all the time and that was what happened to me and I almost destroyed relationships with family members because I just wouldn't stop harping on about this trauma oh and the vomiting after a year of alcoholism I started getting this constant vomiting like once I'd puked once I would be doing nothing but puking for the next four days night and day I was too nauseous to even swallow my own saliva I was too nauseous to lie down so night and day for four days I would be awake watching Netflix um, spitting my saliva out into a bucket because I couldn't even swallow anything without throwing up and the nausea was painful I was sweaty I was shaking I could hardly move I probably should have been in hospital. Like say you can't go cold turkey when this is what you're drinking, but how do you not go cold turkey when you can't swallow anything? So I would have to try and get some alcohol into me and I would get to the point where my hands were going into spasm um, and you know, I was starting to just feel really, really fucked in the head from alcohol withdrawal and from withdrawal from all my medication because I couldn't take that either. Like literally I remember my hands would contract and they would get stuck in this position and that would be the point at which I'd think, oh my god, yeah, I really need to try and get some alcohol in me because I don't know what else is going to start like spasming soon. Um, so it was really scary. And as for having a normal life, as for being functional, are you kidding? Like I said, you have no energy to do anything and you're crazy all the time. So the other thing that happened was that I let into the lives of me and my family somebody who was intensely toxic and manipulative. I don't want to talk about that person. I don't want to think about that person, but my family is still contractually tied to this person because they were so manipulative that they backed my family into a corner and now they won't let go, even three years later. That just, oh, makes me want to smack a bitch to this day. Um, the fact that I allowed my mom to be put in that position and to still be in that position and to still be in a position where financially she could lose everything because of someone I let into our lives because of just being such a drunken mess that I wasn't thinking straight and that meant I, I was easy target and you know they saw my family and you know they knew they were easy targets too and uh that you know that is something that I can't fix it doesn't matter how sober I get I can't fix that uh you know, I've thought about doing some very extreme things to <laughs> to fix that, and um, yeah. So all in all, <laughs> my experience of alcoholism was hell in a bucket. It was the worst year of my life. 2017 was hands down the worst year of my life ever, and I've had some pretty rotten years. I had suicide plans mapped out towards the end of my alcoholism I you know I'd literally just thought I can't live like this I this body this body that I've destroyed I can't live like this I don't want to and eventually rehab was put on the table that it was like look this this needs to happen something needs to be done about this this is a mess yeah um and rehab wasn't for me because 
every rehab I spoke to said, we're going to take you off methadone. And I was like, this is, this, I need this. I know I need this from past experience. I know I need this. And honestly, when I finally did quit, having an increase in methadone was one of the things that helped me quit. So that was a good decision on my part to stay on the methadone. But it did mean I couldn't go to rehab. I couldn't get treatment and I had to do it all by myself and I had to taper off it all by myself using nothing but alcohol, which I did. <laughs> and uh, that still kind of amazes me to this day. So alcohol wise, I wasn't functional versus on heroin, doing a degree and completing it um, and having a social life and all of that. Whereas alcohol, the only people I socialized with were generally toxic and manipulative or they were addicts too. And and then, as I say, you've got the way that other people treat you, that, you know, when it's heroin, people are worried for you. They want to help you. They, they want to get you straight. Whereas when it's alcohol, no one takes it seriously. Even when they can see how serious it is, even when they can see the fat with an anorexic mind, you're completely miserable. You hate yourself. And yet they just think you're having way too much fun. They think you're doing it because it's way too fun because this is what they think about alcohol. People have a drink, it's a fun thing to do. You just, you're just abandoning your responsibilities and having fun. They don't realize that it's every bit as much of a hooked in addiction problem as heroin is. And actually it's a way more toxic drug. That heroin, you know, opiates are prescribed to people as pain relief. And if you know the dosage that you're given and you stick to that dosage and there are no cuts in it, Opiates are a very, very, very safe drug to take, whereas alcohol is deeply toxic. You know, you can die from alcohol poisoning in a single night or you can die from liver failure and uh, so many awful conditions when you go at it for a long time. Other thing I should mention, I did end up with nerve damage um, from alcohol. I was starting to lose the feeling in these two fingers. They started tingling at first and then they started going numb. Um, I was also, I'm pretty sure, getting some damage to my brain from drinking. Um, I did some reading about this recently and I was like, oh my god, that was me. And the things they mentioned were lack of spatial awareness. So you constantly keep crashing into things and losing your balance all the time. These are both signs of damage to your nerves and damage to your brain. Like obviously bashing into things and having bad balance. Drunk, you would think. But even after I got sober for about three months, two months, three months, I was still, I had terrible balance. I kept crashing into things and I was just thinking, is this ever going to go away? And it did, thank God. Like my balance is fine now. I don't crash into things. These two fingers are a little bit tingly at times, but they're basically fine. It's amazing how well your body can heal when you put the alcohol down, you keep it out of your system. Money, you know, 40 to 80 pounds a week versus 140 pounds a week to 210 pounds a week. That's how much I was spending on alcohol. And if I had have not been living with my parents at that point, I would have been absolutely out on the street. I would have been homeless. I would have been a homeless wino. In essence, my life was just completely obliterated and destroyed when I was drinking. And honestly, when I look at alcohol now, all I see is fatness, sweatiness, sickness and misery. That's, you know, when I walk down the alcohol aisle, it's not like my mouth is watering. It's not like I'm thinking, oh my God, what if I could do this? Shall I get some? Shall I drink all of it? There are none of those thoughts. You know, when I drive around the areas of Birmingham that I used to buy heroin in, oh yeah, those thoughts are there. But alcohol, it's no. All I have is is misery, fatness and misery from from that year. I have no temptation there. And that's the reason that I am able to drink occasionally, because I have no good feelings towards alcohol whatsoever. Heroin versus alcohol is the right drug legal. The fact that it is socially sanctioned, not just to drink, but to get blazing drunk. I want to talk more about what you see in people when you don't drink much or at all socially and you go out and you see people drinking socially and you see what it does to them and you see what it does to their lives when they're heavier drinkers you just think why is this poison so socially acceptable when an opiate that I took and I managed to really even though I was a daily user 
it didn't ruin my life in any way and it didn't ruin my health in any way whereas alcohol wrecked everything um obviously as i say everyone's experiences are different some people will have no i wouldn't say anyone will have a experience that's the reverse i think anyone who's been an alcoholic will say yeah it basically it wrecked my health for sure wrecked my energy levels wrecked my relationships wrecked a large portion of my life even if you weren't as severe an alcoholic as i was it's going to have wrecked a lot of things that is that i feel like is is standard anyone who's been an alcoholic is going to have things wrecked um and obviously yeah there are people who've, who've been heroin addicts and it's wrecked their life to an equal degree but i've spoken to so many people since i shared my experience of heroin addiction i've spoken to so many people who were like oh my god finally someone is saying it finally someone is talking about the fact that you can do this or have done this and actually it doesn't wreck your life and it doesn't deserve the stigma that it has so i'm not saying you should take heroin addiction lightly definitely not i'm saying you should take all addictions seriously and alcohol addiction you definitely need to take seriously so if there is someone in your family who is even if you just see them as oh kind of this like funny like hard drinking bit of a wino uncle or whatever it is in your family just imagine that it was heroin instead and how you would feel about that and how you would react to that and then take another look at the way that you treat that person um do you enable them do you buy them booze do you let them get drunk or encourage them do you joke about it because the likelihood is they're probably not cool with it even if they laugh along with you if they're someone who alcohol is wrecking their health um, even if that's just making them really really overweight and sweaty and they can't get around making them breathless and all the rest of it they know it's it's wrecking their health they, they don't feel great they might be the life and soul of the party but believe me they wake up every morning feeling like absolute shit so don't joke about it it's not a joke um take it every bit as seriously as if it was heroin or crack because alcohol in high doses over a long period is going to take you out and it's going to take you out in a very very horrible way and you feel it every step of the way you do it took me years to be remotely happy to be off heroin and even even now as i say i would rather be on a prescription heroin script than a prescription methadone script um and i feel like my life would be better if i was so that's that's something i don't think i'm ever going to be fully over whereas alcohol no regrets no looking back i there is not a single good memory from that time at all i mean you know apart from the fact that you forget a lot of stuff i just remember being suicidally miserable um all the time you know every night i was on the phone to the samaritans like crying my eyes out screaming into a pillow i you know i phoned the samaritans every single night for weeks because i was so miserable um I am so glad to be over all of that and to have it in the rearview mirror and I can't see myself ever going back and if I ever do meet anyone who is even sliding into alcoholism I take it very seriously and sometimes that shocks people sometimes people expect or, or they feel like well you know I just I just like a drink or 20 every night you know that's that's not really a big deal it's like I can see you slipping away you're not the person i remember you're not the person i enjoy being around your life is going to shit why can't you see this you can't see it because you're drunk all the time and that's a subject for a whole other video but more addiction related videos to come including as i say how i tapered off alcohol by myself at home using nothing other than alcohol because i do think that is something important to get out there for anyone who is like i was struggling with this and who for whatever reason cannot get into rehab or doesn't want to go to rehab i think that's an important video to make so i will make it soon uh so subscribe and all of that if you are interested and i am finally gonna shut up so see you soon over and out bye bye